Aloha, everyone. Um, I just want to say something about everybody here. Just one word that describes them to me as leaders. When I think of Blake, I think of courage. When I think of Robbie, I think of integrity. When I think of Colbert, I think of principles. And when I think of Pono, I think of values. And one of the things that I had the gift of being able to do was get to know Pono's father. And he kind of adopted me and many of us. And one of the things that he told me one day was that, you know, people are more important than power and money. People are more important than power and money. And if you think about it, um, as we live our lives, that's what, what it's all about. You become more, people are more important than power and money. And I've had the gift of being able to do many different jobs, some of them not so good, some of them many mistakes, but I learned many things along the way. And I, I guess maybe just to share with you some of the things that I've learned, if you look at today's environment and you look what's going on today, what do you see out there? Everyone's blaming everybody for what's going on and what's not working. It's the politics of blame. It's been going on for generations. Democrats blaming Republicans, Republicans blaming Democrats, conservatives blaming liberals, liberals blaming conservatives. Everybody's blaming everybody for what's wrong. But if you think about it in your life, what do you have? You have the gift of time and energy. Time and energy. And the gift to choose what to do with it. But if you're going to spend your whole time blaming somebody else who made it, who's wrong and why things aren't good, how much time do you have to actually solve the problem? You don't want any time. So a lot of us are wasting our time, wasting our energy, wasting our gift by blaming. And the other thing that I've learned is that policies, rules, regulations, policies, and procedures, and I've done many of them from you know, the uh, Educational Reform Act to um, civil service reform to the procurement law. And when you look at all of those, their policies, procedures, rules, regulations. But in the end, who is the one to carry them out? It's people. So a policy, a plan, a rule, a regulation is only as good as the people who implement them. Only as good as the people who implement them. So I contend that we still keep looking for this one leader that's going to save us, that's going to tell us, we're going here, we're going to do that. And it's really all of you. It's really all of us. Each one of us is within ourselves to make a difference. The other day I was driving by um, uh, Roosevelt High School, taking my daughter to school, and she never wants to drive by Roosevelt ever again. She's so scared to go drive by there. And, um, because I was driving by, and as school was starting, and what did I see? Two boys fighting, fighting right there on the street, and everybody watching them, and the people from Mano going like this. And so I stop my car, I get out, and I break up the fight, and I tell the boys, stop, stop already. You know, my daughter was like, Dad, what are you doing? But somebody had to stop the fight. If you don't stop the fight, a car would have hit the two kids, and they would have got into more trouble. So leading doesn't mean you have to have a title, a, a job. It just means intervening, trying to do the right thing when it comes up and making a difference. So it's in each one of you. Only you can change. You cannot make the other person change. You're the one that can change. And that's how we can bring collective ambition and collective change within state government. And I think this is the first time in 16 years that a governor, a government has decided to get together and talk with leaders like yourself to have the moment, to have even the time to get that done. We pass all these laws, all these rules. When do we have time to train? When do we have time to talk? When do we have time to collaborate? So this is a great beginning, a time for you to do that. So Pono wanted me to just share a little bit about what we're doing at Hawaii Tourism Authority. And it's kind of a reflection of what we do all of us what we do. And if you think about it, 2007 was our best year ever. Best year ever. $35 million a day gets spent by visitors in Hawaii every day. That's their hard earned money that comes out of their pocket. And once they get off the plane, they spend it. And they, they enjoy Hawaii and the experience. $35 million a day. 
That's about $3.7 million in state tax revenue for the day. Three point. <laughs> What happened, though, to Hawaii and what happened to the world in 2008? For us, six really bad things happened. Aloha Airlines went bankrupt. ATA Airlines went bankrupt. We lost one million air seats to Hawaii. We had the Lehman Brothers financial meltdown. Then we had the H1N1 virus. Oil reached $150 a barrel, and we lost two cruise ships. All in 13 months. So from $35 million a day, it went to $30 million a day in 2008. Then in 2009, it went to $27 million a day. And, and then in 2010, it got back to 30. In 2011, it got back to 34 million. Today, it's at $39 million a day. Blake, $4.1 million in taxes per day <laughs> by visitors. <laughs> Why did that happen? I believe because when we started to recover, we made a commitment to ourselves to never forget who we are. So we, there was a lot of criticism. I remember an article in PBN written by my friend Chad Blair who said, this guy McCartney doesn't know what he's talking about. He's talking about aloha. He's talking about what the queen said about what she did to live aloha and make, make some hard decisions. Because I had a board meeting and we were presenting our budget. So to present the context of what we're trying to do, I use these quotes. And he wrote this whole thing and said, wow, this guy is running tourism and he's quoting the queen? You know, you remember that story. But what we were trying to tell all of us is as we recover, let's never ever forget who we are as a people, place, and culture. Because we can be like any other place in the world, but we have to be us. If we are us, we can succeed. And that's what we were really trying to say. So when I think about one of the things that sticks in my mind when my first trip to Japan, I was on the Japan Airlines plane and I was going to Japan to see our best customers. And what was I gonna do? What was I gonna say to them? What was I gonna share with them? And as I, we were taxiing out on the runway, I saw a construction crew working and they had red shirts and red hats on and they put down their shovels, they took off their hats, and they bowed at the Japanese or Japan Airlines plane. They bowed, these two local Hawaiian men, big guys, big brothers, they bowed and they waved at us. And at that moment, I knew who I was working for. I was working for them, their families, and I was going to see our customers. And they were saying, aloha and thank you to the people on the plane. They didn't have to do that. They could have just kept working, but they waved and they bowed. And so when we think about our purpose at Hawaii Tourism Authority, what do we do? We help to feed Hawaii. We don't feed Hawaii, we help to feed Hawaii. We help to make that happen. What's the other thing that we try to do? You think about travel, and you think about what Auntie Pilahi said. She said, as the world searches for world peace, the world will turn to Hawaii because Hawaii has the key, and that key is aloha. So if you think about all the people that work in travel, what do we do? We bring people from different races, cultures, nationalities, backgrounds together to experience each other, to experience our lives. When we do that, the world becomes smaller. So maybe we cannot talk stink about somebody because we know them now. You know, maybe we actually understand what they're doing rather than what somebody's telling us they're doing. So if you work in travel, if you work in the visitor industry, what you're really, really doing is you're making peace. So whether you're a housekeeper, whether you're a bellman, whether you're a taxi cab driver, what do they do? They work 24 hours a day, seven days a week to keep this machine going that feeds all of us. They miss Christmas, they miss New Year's, they miss their holidays with their families because somebody has to work to see the guests come in and, and to, to provide service to them. And they do that every single day you know, to make our lives better. And that's tremendous purpose. And when you think about it, people talk about aloha. It's not for sale. We never, ever say that. There's a big difference between service and aloha. Good service is good service is good service is good service. Aloha is something different. It is not service. It is something very special. So every time I make speeches to whether it's Travel Weekly or uh, a convention, I try to close with this, and I'm going to close with this 
to you. And actually, it's an honor to read this because, you know, Pono put this together. His dad actually put this into the statutes. So if you go to chapter 5.7 of our Hawaii Revised Statutes, it's in there. It empowers all of us as public employees to reside with the law spirit. And Kober Matsumoto was there when Auntie Pilahi shared these words at the Ilikai Hotel, right? right. You were in high school, Lanai High School. And all these leaders were there. And all these people, Governor Burns had a conference in the year 2000. And he wanted Hawaii to think about where it was going and how it was going to get there. And there's fights between agriculture and tourism and growth, no growth. And everybody was telling us what to do and talking about Aloha. And finally, this woman stood up. And she said, you know what Aloha means? This is what it means. And here's the words that she said. She said, the Aloha spirit is the coordination of the heart and mind within each person. It brings each person to the self. Each person must think and emote good feelings to the others. In the contemplation and pr presence of the life force, the following pre uh, free translation may be used. Akahai, meaning kindness, to be expressed with tenderness. The deeper meaning of akahai is grace. Lokahi, meaning unity, to be expressed with harmony. The deeper meaning of lokahi is unbroken. Olu olu meaning agreeable, to be expressed with pleasantness. The deeper meaning of olu olu is gentle. Ha'a ha'a, meaning humility, to be expressed with modesty. The deeper meaning of ha'a ha'a is to be empty. Ahunui, meaning patience, to be expressed with perseverance. The deeper meaning is waiting for the moment. These are the traits of character that express the charm, warmth, and sincerity of Hawaii's people. It was the working philosophy of native Hawaiians and was presented to the people of Hawaii as a gift. Aloha is more than a word of greeting or farewell or a salutation. Aloha means mutual regard and affection and extends warmth and caring with no obligation in return. Aloha is the essence of relationships in which each person is important to every other person for the collective existence. Aloha means to hear what cannot be said, to see what cannot be seen, and to know the unknowable. So ladies and gentlemen, as you journey into your purpose to make government better, to make people's lives better, just remember that if you reside with the Aloha spirit within yourself, you can make a difference. Thank you very much. Aloha and mahalo. No mistake for the title and the topic that we had today. No mistakes. Um, Mike called me the night before he gave that speech to his board. And he asked me if it's OK to share what he was about to share, knowing that it would be a tremendous risk. And then the article came out. And I remember him calling me and said, I just need a friend to talk to, because he was so being chastised for speaking about aloha. It's not about aloha, it's about heads in beds and butts in seats. But what has turned around our tourism industry? So when we speak about diversity and diversifying our economy, quite often we think about it away from. As an economist, when I speak about diversification, I think about diversification within. I don't want to stop people from coming to Hawaii. That's a very bad day for Hawaii. Nobody comes. I want to change the reason they come and how they come. And the greatest reason for them to come is aloha. So thank you, Mike. Additive Links Online Hawaii Area. That's the acronym. <laughs> I remember it. <laughs> and it means nothing. <laughs> Additive links online Hawaii area, Aloha. <laughs> because they wanted it to be Aloha Connects. I'm sorry for all of you who thought that um, Al Gore discovered the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Carol. <laughs> um, uh, just before we go into some Q&A, I want you to folks to think about this. That we all were speaking, you know, to you in a, in a way that is just to connect with each of you. 
not from any different position than we all are as people who love our home. Last night I was in a meeting with some kahu, kahuna, till 10 o'clock. There were six of us. Actually, I wouldn't say us, I was asked to come. And they wanted to learn some things. And one of the things I started to share with them is why this place that we call home is the only place in the world where our royalty put their resources in four different trusts that today continues on. Kamehameha Schools, Luna Lilo Trust, Queen's Hospital, and Queen Liliuokalani Trust. Why is it that we look out in the entire world and we don't see that any place else except in Hawaii? Why? How come this place, the royalty did that? And so I explained, and this is a message to you, that it's the difference between to me and for me. That our ali'i understood that the resources they were given was not for them. It's not for me. It was to me to do something. It's not for me to have something. It's a working philosophy and living foundation of this place. That all of us have different tasks. All of us have different resources. All of us have different ideas, but if we follow those who came before us, that it's not for us, but to us, I think that this group, in fact I know, because it doesn't take a lot, is in the position to transform not just government, but maybe help us remember who we are, as Mike talked about. And so to possibly inspire you with um, an opportunity that goes into um, maybe s just sharing your mana'o or asking and or engaging the panel. A few years ago, Mike and I were asked to be on a heritage tourism panel. And the conversations was about how we leverage the historic sites to get resources from the tourism industry. So Mike and I and a couple of other folks were on this panel. And what I had done is I had brought a couple dozen cream puffs that I made the night before. As my wife, I just told her, I gotta make cream puffs. Why? I don't know. Something tells me I gotta make cream puffs. So that morning as we were together at the Capitol, I started passing out a dozen cream puffs. And people say, where'd you get these from? I made them. Yeah, right. I did. They're pretty good. Have fun. <laughs> Not knowing, because we have to go to empty, as Mike talked about, the moment of emptiness. So everyone did their presentation, and then I was the last one. And then I realized why I had to make the cream puffs. I said, how many of you in this audience had my cream puffs this morning? And 12 raised their hands. I said, OK. I love Japanese films, and the reason why I love Japanese films is quite often their symbolism. We may not give you the answer, but it might reveal the puzzle. I'd like to tell you a story about my grandmother. Eldest daughter of 13 children, born so poor in Wailuku, Maui. And as we were growing up, the way that grandma expressed her love to people is she would bake and she would cook. Charlie would recognize that's the way people grew up on Maui, on Oahu, too, yeah. And so when we all became of age, we became grandma's delivery boys and, you know, driving grandma all over town or her, her goodies, malasada, sweet bread rolls, etc. She was 85 and she called me one day and she said, Grandma hasn't made anything for you in a long time. What do you want? Chinese grandmother, nothing. What do you want? She's scolding me. Okay, Grandma, okay. You know what you hardly ever made, but they were the best were your cream puffs. Okay. Two weeks later, come pick up your cream puffs. So I'll go to Grandma's house. She was 85. They're a little burnt on top. I scrape off the burnt. Oh, the custard. 
Come on, how do you make these? Well, you got to use Avocet. If you know Avocet, you're old. Okay? Avocet, eggs, started to go. No, 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 no. I don't want the recipe. Can you teach me? Let's do this together. Okay, when? Two weeks. Okay, you come back in two weeks. You and Grandma go make cream puffs. Took my cream puffs, left. Next day, I get a call from my dad. Grandma had a massive stroke. She died at the bus stop. It's over. No cream puffs, no jelly roll, no cream roll, no nothing. It's over. A year and a half later, I get this hankering. Boy, I sure wish I had one of Grandma's cream puffs. Go to my kitchen and all of a sudden started to experiment, innovate. How do you make a cream puff? Memory. What do they taste like? And created a recipe. What did she say? Made a batch, took it to a family party, put it on the table. Somebody came up, took one, took a bite, said, who made grandma's cream puffs? So as we were at the Capitol that day, I said, how many of you had my cream puffs? 12 people raised their hand. I said, they're good. In fact, they're very good. How ono are they now? And people looked at me. I said, before I put the heritage in these cream puffs, these were just cream puffs. But when you put the heritage inside, oh, so, oh, no, yeah. So what is heritage? It's our people, it's our places, it's our stories. And how valuable is it? It's invaluable, it's priceless. You'll find that each one of us up here are storytellers. We use story to connect. In a world that is looking for elevator pitches, what Mike shared is that we are not elevator pitch people. We are people of connection. And it's our heritage which is priceless, which allows us to hold this very special ano we call, spirit, that this is not for us. This is to us for that connection. So in that, I, just, I want you to know that we are hopefully going to hear your ano and see your mana'o as you go out and do this work. But this is deep tissue body work. So thank you. I, I applaud all of our panelists, first of all. And then I would like to open it up to questions. So we've got about 15 minutes worth of questions. Yeah. Anyone? Anyone? Tell your story. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Comments, questions, stories? Yes. Um, my state Andrew. Day day role is health and public affairs for the Department of Defense. I'm a National Guardsman. And um, there's something that happens when the Hawaii National Guardsman deploy to Iraq and Afghanistan. And, you know, they're having that green off blue violence over there where they. Afghanis are turning on the soldiers. It's not happening with the white Because they have the all, because they share, because they can see that adversity and they respect the people. And it's seen time and time again when the white guys move out, and you get the mainland guys come in, and the other four guys come in, it starts right back up. Yeah. They respect the white guys and they'll protect the white guys mm -hmm. because they have that respect and that aloha. And it's a very powerful thing in your life. And it's just one how it, how that affects even the military, how it affects the National Guard. And they want to work with us. They don't necessarily want to work with, with everyone else. They want to work with the boy that when they go over there. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for the story. Also, can let me just say thank you for what you do for all of us mm -hmm. to get our backs and to do what you do so that we can live our lives. I cannot even begin to tell you what you guys do for us. So I just want to say, on behalf of all of us, mahalo, thank you so much.
Thank you, Andrew. Anyone else? Yes, Bob. This conference is entitled uh, IT, and the technology is somehow, once properly used, is going to transform us. I agree it will transform us, but innovation in the context we've been discussing here is not a consequence of new technology. And what I'm concerned about is, is that what we've discussed here, that at the actual process is held accountable to that. And I'm a little concerned that when I go and just bought a new Apple and had to sign the contract, 19 pages long, and I read it. Have you ever read those? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you bought a machine that will receive our technology. You do not own it. If we change it, your machine may become obsolete when we advance beyond your petty interest. That's exactly what it meant. So I am mightily concerned that technology properly pushed to the front of the line might be falling off a cliff that isn't fiscal. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how we're going to get this through, other than the fact that I'm beginning to raise holy hell. Uh, and I date back to the 60s when Tom Gill said, pardon me for the uh, issue, he said bluntly as lieutenant governor that he did not consider making all the lines of uh, chambermaids and waiters was an advance in the civilization. When we look at the technology issue, I think we're to be drawn off track. Mm -hmm. And I'd really like to know what type of tests, and the ones that I'm looking at is the ahua hua ah, which if you really trace that back, it's the Hawaiians came by boat. And if they didn't arrive, they didn't cooperate. And placing that logic on land tenure, what happened in the Mahele was they gave the king two choices, be simple or trust. And there's a third option, service tenure. It meant you didn't own the land, but you had an obligation to make the land productive for the whole community. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Ahua Pua, ah, it means that the elite would readjust land use such to maximize the benefit for the whole community. Now that's radical thinking, and that's person socialism. It actually means values will be weighed, and change will be for the better. These are inspiring ideas. And what I'm concerned about is when 20, 400 to 600 foot tall towers go up on the main school land with the premise that we are not going to eat up agricultural land. We're going to bring in people who can afford to live here, and the rest of us are going to have to pay more to live here because keep them going, they can afford to pay for it, and we can. I want land allocated to square footage to agricultural use as a condition of building a building. Mm. That might then set it aside for land, for agricultural use, and I'd like to give it to the state government to force it to not tax more, but to do more for the community in general. Is that a question? <laughs> Is there a question in there, Bob? Or just a statement? <laughs> I'm glad she's not here. <laughs> I don't mean to talk more about this, but I think it's back to what everyone talked about here. 
it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure we don't lose our values and our purpose. So technology is a tool, but it's not the answer. We still are the resource. We still are the human resource that will make things happen, make good decisions, do things for the people. So I think it's going to be incumbent upon us to provide that balance, that technology is going to be a tool, but it's not the end all be all. It's still going to meet, need people to make things happen. You know, Bob, in my slides, there was one that said under reverence, the first word that came up was haku. Do you folks know what the meaning of haku is? What is haku? To weave, to braid. Well, why would that be under that reverence? <clears throat> In Mike's revelation that he was reading of ha -a ha -a -a ha nui ha you combine those two deeper meanings, ha 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 to be empty, aho nui, waiting for the moment, <sighs> the moment of emptiness. <sighs> Ku. We know ha is our energy, aloha, that ha. Ku. We also know the word ku. It has to be upright. Ku, the God, to be up. So if you consider that word haku, and these are the philosophies, one of the philosophies that she shared with me. <sighs> ku. As we ha, we ku. Others know the process of haku, which is to break, to compose. Haku mele, haku olelo, to, to weave a story. Hakule to weave a lay. What is ku? K, not ke. K. The sound of ke is for kapili. Kapili is the word to bind up, to erect, to resurrect, to lash. It's kapili. K. U. What is u? U is the sound of uhane, the soul, the spirit. Kapili wuhane is to resurrect the soul, the spirit. So most people who understand the meaning, the literal meaning of haku, to weave and to braid, is just that. But what she taught me was haku is actually in the process of putting our energy that Mike talked about. Fourth, you kapili uhane. You lift up the souls. Now look through the eyes of our queen as she's been deposed. And what did she do? She started to haku like crazy. Process, purpose. Colbert was talking about content, context. Process, purpose. People say they haku, and I said, that's not haku. They're doing the process of haku. That's not the purpose of haku. Why do I mention this? When you haku ale. You haku so that it is tight, so that you can reveal the beauty that we weave into this lay. When you look at a lay, if you're a master lay maker, what you do is you pick it up and you shake it. Because the quality of the lay is dependent on the strength of your backing. Then you look at the back and you look at the back because that reveals the beauty of the lay. It's not what's on top, it's what's on the back. So what I am sharing is, I believe that what we shared today is the back of the lay. And for us to change or to be able to house and appropriately reveal what the beauty of the lay is, which I think is what you're after, you have to have the backing of the lay so that haku occurs. And that's my response. Thank you. Can I add one other story that um, my daughter was in a keiki hula group, and we went to Japan a few years ago, and they danced around the country. The last place we danced was Spa Hawaiians. Now, Spa Hawaiians is featured in a movie called Hula Girls, and is the ultimate place for a Japan hula dancer. 
I mean, it's like the Rockettes in New York City. And they have like national tryouts on TV. And so, you know, came to the evening show, our, our, our girls, Keiki went on first, and then the girls from Spa Hawaiians. In my life, I have never seen better technical dancing. I mean, no girl moved any differently than any other one. I mean, if you blurred your eyes, it was like a single motion. Uh, just, uh, you know, not a hair or a piece of costuming out of place. And they moved in a unison of like 24 dancers. Just stunning. But if you watch the faces of the audience when they watched our kids, and when they watched the Spa Hawaiian girls, the tears were in their eyes for the kids. And it wasn't just the kids. It was a spirit in the dancing that technical excellence cannot make up for. You know, and, and in our desire for perfection and technical excellence, if we miss the spirit part, we won't get it. And that's why, even though Japan has more hula dancers than there are probably native Hawaiians on the planet, <laughs> the Japanese keep coming to Hawaii because they know that it isn't just technical excellence. They gotta go find the spirit that was inside the dance that made it different. And watching that was one of those, you go, whoa, it is so different. Even when you see young people doing the dance from just watching technical perfection. You folks are in the technical business. You are in the business of trying to achieve as close as we can to perfection. Not without spirit. Particularly not here, not without spirit. Or, or the rest of the folks that you're working with won't come with you in a way that will be meaningful. And I think that was to some degree what the gentleman a little while ago was saying. There's an underlying spirit that belongs inside of it. It's not just the actions, and it's not just the technology. I'd like to ask Blake to wrap this up for us. Me? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I think it's so appropriate. Well, um, You're such a champion. No, no, no. So, well, I, I am surprised, and I will say that, um, you know, when I was asked by Randy um, to participate in this panel, you know, I thought initially, I was like, oh my God, another thing I gotta do. I got like 10 <laughs> meetings, I tried to prep the budget, we got bills to do. Um, but, you know, when I, when I took a step back and I really thought about the tremendous amount of work and dedication um, that we are asking of employees and of the personnel and of the people doing the real work, um, that was when I realized, you know what, I need to invest some time in preparing a presentation and actually conveying what I think is something meaningful for all of you. Because at the end of the day, I think as all the panelists have said, um, you folks are here to do the yeoman's share of the work. It will come down from the top and it'll percolate down through various procedures and processes, um, but ultimately the work has to be done by all of you folks. And on behalf of the governor um, and all of the leaders, I want to just sincerely, sincerely thank you because it is going to be difficult, it is going to be a challenge, and we know we are asking a lot of you. but. If we want to make Hawaii a better place, and if we all go back to the reasons why we went into public service, why we became part of the government, and why we believe the state of Hawaii is such a special place, that to me is a core value that we all share. And so just remember that every single day as you're going through your daily duties as to why you need to continue to push forward. But on behalf of the governor and on behalf of all of our leadership in the administration, I want to thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Awesome.